Okay, talking before the session, we decided that the boundary between clarifications and substantive comments and deep insights and occasional pontification has been loose and subject to judgment, so we'd like to just open the channels. And to make sure this last session of the day is lively, we'll encourage two-finger quick follow-ups with appropriate constraint, and we'll take it from there. Joe. Uh, could you tell us about how much of the world's greenhouse gas emission CO2 currently come from steel cement? Remind us of that, that piece of the wedge, how big that is? About 7% from iron and steel. About oh, sorry. This is it's about... It, all, it obviously depends who you ask. It's about 7% from iron and steel and 6% from uh, cement. It's a big number, yeah. It's a big number. <laughs> yeah, but for the cement, it's about half calcination, half energy. Yeah. 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 Right. Some of it comes from calcium. Yeah. Royce. Can't just change the rule. So, uh, okay, my turn. Uh, on, on your last point about doubling the capex. It seems like it must be more than that because it seems that it's, yes, if you double the capex, but it depreciates fairly quickly, the plant runs a long time. It's kind of like the hydroelectric storage scenario, right? So uh, beyond the capex is, you know, so uh, fixed and variable costs after that. Uh, you know, are those, uh, you know, how, how much higher are those? For some yeah, those, yeah, those can also increase. This is, a, this is a, the big reason why industrial CCS hasn't taken off because you know they can uh, they can significantly increase. The other reason is because the um, industries don't think they're going to get um, actually you know uh, regulated, right? Because they know how expensive putting CCS on their plant is, and they know that they've got no other choice. So one of the reasons why a lot of work's been done on, without wanting to um, accuse everybody of being. Uh, Duplicitous. One of the reasons why I think a lot of work's been going on on amine scrubbing is because you can easily come out with a number for amine scrubbing that says this will bankrupt um, my plant. What is what is the product? What do you get out after uh, amine scrubbing? So what that's that's, that's basically that's a post combustion capture um, system. So all it really does is it takes the um, CO2 from the exhaust and puts it to a, a hundred uh, percent CO2 stream which goes away. It doesn't affect the cement chemistry. Direct capture, oxyfuel, and calcium looping would potentially affect the cement chemistry, although they haven't. It doesn't seem that they do that much. So my question uh, relates to the costs of steel and concrete when you use them to build your low carbon energy infrastructure because the steel and concrete are probably the largest single ingredient that goes into it. And, and partly from the perspective of life cycle cost, but, but more from the perspective of, of just the economics. And first thing I just need to interject is that, that I have a lot of skepticism about trying to clean this stuff up because this is heavy industry is the stuff that's easiest to export to countries that are willing to burn fossil fuel. And so, so you really, that, that's, a, that's a, I think, a challenging problem. And, and we've certainly exported most of it out of the United States, out of California, Washington State, and such. But I did a calculation where I pulled out um, life cycle assessments for wind turbines. Vestas has done some very good studies. And then for nuclear plants, because I was interested in finding out how much these commodities contribute to the cost of construction. And for, for if, if you pay $5,000 per kilowatt to buy an AP1000 from Westinghouse, the commodities, the steel, concrete, and copper contribute less than 1% of that price, which is actually, that's really sad. Um, <laughs> if, if, <laughs> well, no, they don't sell very many of them. Vestas, it turns out, you do the same calculation, and if they're selling at $1,750 per kilowatt, um, that it's 11% of the purchase price. So the Vestas is far more efficient in terms of converting steel and concrete into wind turbines, but that also seems to say that, that you're, you, you, you have serious issues if you make those commodities a lot more expensive by trying to decarbonize them. How, do you fit, how does one fit that question? Does it make sense to decarbonize these materials when they're the essential ingredients to producing clean energy in the first place to build out that infrastructure? Well, I guess I can start with an answer. 
I mean, to the extent that you believe climate change is a problem, we need to decarbonize. I don't, it's a self evident answer. You have to do it. The question is, and I think, you know, that's what we're really saying here about heavy industry is you've got to figure out new processes or material substitution or to make something like CCS um, uh, cheap. And it's not something that can happen simply by the industry, especially these very commoditized industries, to do it on their own. So there's going to have to be some combination of policy, uh, R&D work, and honest to God, large scale experiments like, yeah, we'll build the bridge. OK, we'll build the cement plant. We'll build the new steel plant. And, and it's going to take a consortia of people, because nobody can take the risk on of putting a billion dollars out there and then saying, well, it didn't work. Let's go on to the next experiment. Yeah, I mean, um, if you're talking about the, the final 20%, you can't offshore it. I mean, it doesn't matter where the um, CO2 emissions are coming from. That's why I'm saying you've got to have a border tax adjustment. You've got to have a tariff based on CO2 intensity. Um, without that, you, 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 none of these things would work, right? So that's absolutely fundamental that um, that needs to happen. Also, if you look at... So the aiming scrubbing is pretty expensive, $100 a ton, 90, $80, $90 a ton, depends who you ask. Um, but these ones have the potential to be significantly cheaper overall in terms of um, dollars per ton of CO2. Now, it's an interesting question as to whether or not, basically, because cement manages to emit such a very large amount of CO2, to produce such a little amount of value add, putting um, carbon capture and storage on cement manufacture increases your cost of cement hugely, but in terms of a dollars per ton of CO2 that you save, it's actually one of the cheapest ways to um, decarbonize the world. So what we're really saying is there needs to be a carbon price. Sorry. <laughs> So just, uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood the oxyfuel kiln, the biggest barrier right now is actually the physical construction of the kiln so that, oxy so that air doesn't infiltrate. Like the chemical processes and everything else is figured out. It's just like build a kiln where air doesn't go in. I wouldn't say that everything is 100% figured out. I would say that we've done lab tests and um, we've simulated 100%, you know, uh, well, not 100%, not but say 70% CO2, 30% um, oxygen. The clinkering reactions went off fine. The material calcined when we thought it would. There weren't any significant issues. The, the cement set and hardened as it should. And um, the, uh, when we did strength tests, they came out exactly the same as um, standard cement that we got from Cemex. So, yeah, I, it, it, I would think that it would be the physical construction of the plant that would be the biggest um, potential worry. So it's not, right now they're not very insulated, but what do you, like, how, what do you need to do to the, What kind of materials would you need? Or? It's not really a materials issue. Do you want to talk, Klaus? Big amount of fuel in a big hollow tube, which is 100 meters long and rotate and, and rotates around its own axis. And they need oxygen, so they don't particularly take care of being airtight. If you now blow in pure oxygen, you need to stuff all these holes in a rotating piece of equipment, which was never designed to do this. So you will never and it lasts 60 years. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, and so it's a lot of. There's a yeah. concept of false air, which is like the 30% of air that they don't really know where it comes from. It just sort of finds its way into the process. So, um, yeah, Oxy that, the, the, the sealing of the, of, the, uh, of the rotating machinery is a, is a hard um, thing. However, you could go to a, there's, there's a folk process, F-O-A-K, and I can't remember exactly what it um, stands for, but it's fluidized oxygen something kiln, which is a different clinkering process, um, which might possibly mean that you could um, get away with it. It needs re-engineering, this is the point. It needs people to actually sit down and think, 
Okay. The kiln is kind of stupid. Let's think of a better thing to do. <laughs> so, so one thought we had, we put the big kiln in a big building, right? And now we at least can seal the building. Now you have a heat management problem because <laughs> the, the, the thing burns a lot of fuel and it gets very fast, very hot in there. <laughs> so th this is very analogous to the magnetite reaction I was talking about where you bring pure oxygen, you bring oxygen in and you have a very controlled environment in a rotating kiln at 1500 Celsius or whatever it is. And it's not easy. And like pure oxygen in those kinds of environments is kind of a scary thing. But, but it's the kind of thing where it needs to be worked on, you know, sequentially by rather larger consortia. Um, I, I did want to ask a question or also build on, we were sort of focused on traditional cement making. There are people who come to RMI all the time with new ideas for cement, yeah. different forms of materials that you can mine. And, and what, are, what are your thoughts about that, that opportunity? Yeah, all right. That's my question. All right, so. Um, <laughs> what are the alternatives, to, especially to cement, because I think that you have that natural CO2 release when you're actually making it and everything like that. It, it's kind of very, very difficult. Steel, it seems like they have some alternatives that might work. What about cement? Do we have an alternative? Um, so there's lots of people who are working on things like uh, uh, magnesium-based cements, um, those sorts of things. They're fine if it's non-structural. Um, so there's, there's a lot of the cement that's actually used is used in non-structural applications like um, paving, that sort of thing, right? So yeah, they're okay, but um, the, the major problem is that, that Cement that you actually make now, Portland cement, hugely cheap. I mean, it doesn't seem like that. I, I, I don't know. Is that a really big scientific challenge? I think it actually. I think it is because think about the start of the material here, which is calcium carbonate, which is reasonably abundant in the world. So what you're really asking scientists to do is say, could you f create a new source of material? that Mother Nature hasn't made, and please make it in the millions of tons per year level. That's a pretty big ask. We make, we make water, and then we make cement. Cement is the second largest thing that humanity makes. Right? So it's, a, but it's yeah, also clean water. Yeah. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's, it's just on volume alone. You know, if you go back to steel making, it's, it, but so like a, a good sized iron ore mine in the Pilbara of Western Australia is mining 300 million tons a year. That's one mine. And, and, and it's 63% pure iron, which is incredible when you think about it. And, and so for example, if people say, well, isn't there another way to reduce iron and maybe we can do it, maybe we can do it with hydrogen. But, but one of the things that's nice about the integrated steel process is that all the, the 27% or the 37% that's not iron that you really don't want comes out in the slag. So how do you do that in a hydrogen process and things like that? So it's just the scale of things in heavy industry that you're trying to deal with. You know, a large smelter in South Africa is using a half a gigawatt of energy in, a, in an area that's probably only five times the size of this room or something. <laughs> Could they be more yeah, I mean, free? Yeah, I mean, there are people that there, there are people that are looking at them. There was a big um, uh, company which was set up by uh, Imperial, a big startup in Imperial, um, and the trouble was they didn't didn't make any money and it folded. So, um, yeah, at the, the issue at the moment is that you know uh, things like Novasem, that sort of stuff. Calera, you heard of Calera? Yeah, I've heard of I've heard of all of them. But they currently don't make money because there is no real demand but for. Capture the carbon on the other ones, maybe they make enough money. If there was a cement, if there was a CO2 price, yes. Okay, I wonder about that. Yeah. But let's let's. let's uh, go okay. and Dan, Pear, Chris. So I actually want to go to the other side of the equation. So not think of scale and not think of economics, but just think kind of pure technologies a little bit back to the core piece, which is. And then can we digest a little bit in terms of the chemistry behind it and are there ways and concepts to come up with zero carbon approaches to the chemistry 
which uh, are the fundamental reactions going forward. So, f for example, there was, and I just Googled it online, uh, you know, an announcement from MIT that said, well, they came up with a, a solar-enabled uh, Lyme process that did solar, solar heat plus solar electrolysis to decarbon, decarbonate the, the calcium carbonate uh, on that. So, I mean, again, that's just pure chemistry at a molecular level, not at scale, anything. So I'm just trying to think outside the box is could we re-articulate or could we come up with low carbon pathways that aren't so CCS dependent? And maybe that's for the chemistry. Again, the issue with, with lime is that it's, it produces even more CO2 per value add than cement. So, yeah, I'm sure we could do something. I mean, you could do solar, solar calcination, but would, would you really want to? I mean, if you've got all that sort of nice concentrated solar energy, might, maybe you want to use it to do something else than make lime. People are, people are doing it around the world. Um, there's solar calciners in um, uh, Spain where people are uh, looking at it, but you still, you've still got the CO2. You're still fundamentally, if you've got calcium oxide, sorry, if you, if you want calcium oxide as your, pro as your product, you know, you're going to start from calcium carbonate. It's, it's one of the most stable minerals on Earth, and that's why it's in, in that form. Right. So 56 grams of calcium oxide makes 44 grams of CO2, and you get $60 worth of calcium oxide. Right. Um, um, I, I, just before we leave, the sort of fundamental question you're asking, Doug, I, I, I'm daunted by cement. I think on the steel side, uh, and smelting and things like that, we actually can take a hard look at material substitution. So that's already happening, for example, in steel, which is fighting tooth and toenail with aluminum for the automotive uh, sector. So I, I think what we need to do, actually, is just some really fundamental stuff would be, if you assume a certain growth rate of the need for uh, current baseline use for steel in the world, break it down from structural steel, things that are class A body panels, et cetera. And then you said, what are the substitutions for each one of those? And you started setting up a program. I think you might get rid of 50% of the steel that way and do it quite economically. And then you've got a much smaller problem to deal with. And the other thing is I think that you might find is assuming that we don't go through another breakneck uh, growth rate, which we may, or maybe we do it one more time after that, can we hit a semi-steady state where we only need to accrete another few percent per year of extra raw virgin steel and really try to work much more in a closed loop? And those numbers, to my mind, I haven't seen them anywhere that says, here's a vision for steel and structural material, not cement, going forward. And if we look at that, I think it will make the problem more tractable and it will make it more obvious about where we put our time and money to best effect. i just say to, to, to add on that, just cool. directly to that, what I noticed is once you do that, all those good alloys like chromium and manganese end up in rebar. <laughs> because you've got your steel recycled, but you are smearing out all the, all the high quality elements you added to it. So, I'd ask you one other thing I'd say is that, and I don't want to say anything disparaging about engineers, but there is a certain level of conservatism in the in the engineering world about building things. And I think if we continue to push our efforts to optimize the use of steel and concrete, we'd probably get a pretty important factor of something uh, against it as well. So I think you know, optimization and, and disaggregation of the problem is quite important. I'd say that one of the um, things that people are looking at in uh, the UK a lot now is actually reuse of old steel. So instead of going through scrap production and electric art furnace and that sort of stuff, you actually take your I-beams out, check they're still sound, and then use them directly, which is the really lowest carbon way to, um, to do it. Um, it's the most sensible uh, thing. Great. Um, actually, this is a clarifying question, I think, that would, um, just based on what, what you just said. Um, so direct iron reduction and electric arc furnaces, if powered by low carbon or zero carbon electricity, 
does that count as zero carbon steel? And if it does, do, is um, like what is is that is that a fifty percent solution? Um, and you can and you, you still need some really high quality stuff. Then why, why can't it be one hundred percent of the solution? Oh, well, I mean, I think you know once you've gone through the cycle once and you've got it, and it was all renewable energy going into the electric arc furnace. Yeah, that's pretty near zero carbon. Um, there is definitely research that needs to continue to bring electric arc furnace steel up to the level of integrated steel, virgin steel. Uh, and there also needs to be this very hard question to say, how much new steel do we really need? And you know what you'll see, and this gets back to real economics, the way the industry works, is that when you're running an integrated steel plant or electric arc furnace, you are competing and you're trying to insert yourself into the market in a very dynamic and competitive way. And you will do things like produce certain types of steel to preserve market share. You may cut price. So there's all these things that are going on that may be creating more virgin steel in the market than what you really need societally. So it, you know, I don't, it, 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 it's a messy thing because, because of the competition and because of the swings in different costs for scrap material, for coking coal, uh, electricity, et cetera, that, that changes that dynamic. So uh, again, I think it, what we need is a, a really good report that sort of says, here's where we could go with structural steel over, or with steel over time. Here's how to tackle it and break it into its parts. So short answer is yes, it could be low carbon. Longer answer is, but we really need to know how much of it we need and how much we need to grow virgin steel. So Steve, actually, you, you touched on something, engineering conservatism. That, that I've also run up against, which relates back to you know, very early regulation when we were looking at boiler and pressure vessels and, and civil structural engineering, we ended up with professional societies developing codes and standards and then the legal system pointing to them. And it's, it's very cumbersome from the perspective of, of any ability to update or to, to optimize there's efforts to try to get performance-based approaches implemented or available within codes and standards for engineering, but ultimately, this this is just a this is just a huge impediment for innovation, and since it takes decades to get codes and standards fixed, do we need to be starting an immediate effort to try to to integrate into codes and standards better flexibility to to decarbonize? construction? And if so, how are people thinking about how to, to tackle that kind of problem? I'm not the best person to answer this, but I, I do know from the team that RMI's had in China for the last three years and has been looking at the decarbonization of that economy, one of the biggest issues is around the use of cement and steel and the fact that actually a large number of the buildings that were built in the last 20, 20 or 30 years are 20 or th they're 30 year buildings. And so they're actually, you know, if you look on the bright side, they need to rebuild a lot of stuff. And there is a real push to say, well, how much can we shave out carbon content by building it right this time? And, and at least in China's more command and control economy, there's probably more opportunity, and, and, they don't have the torch system of the U.S., as far as I can tell. So there's probably more opportunity to test some of those ideas out. Not that I think the Chinese should be the guinea pigs of that, but I, I, I think there's a, that, that is definitely on the table and being discussed there actively uh, and trying to figure out where to do some of the first testing of that. In the cement field, um, there's different classifications of cement. So there's SEM1, SEM2, SEM3, whatever. Um, and some of them have actually quite a high proportion of um, ash in them, all right, from uh, power stations, that sort of stuff, right? And um, that's been good in that it has reduced the amount of uh, clinker that you have to put in because it's, uh, you know, that's the stuff that's really energy intensive to uh, produce. So they do have mechanisms to make a new classification of cement and to, you know, um, sort that out. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it, it's not an overnight process. Uh, back to technical again. Uh, so first I just want to throw out there that you know all those blocks of sulfur that we don't know what to do with? Mm -hmm. So there are some projects looking at how to turn that into a construction material. Right? It melts at 113 degrees C, maybe you can even pour it uh, like cement. Right? The beauty of cement is that you can pour it. Right? Uh, otherwise you could use uh, block uh, construction materials. But uh, 
The, uh, I wanted to uh, just come back to steel for a second. There are um, electrolytic, high temperature electrolytic uh, methods for making steel. So high temperature molten oxide electrolysis starts coming, all coming back to me. I don't know off the top of my head uh, the pros and cons, but it would be interesting to compare that to your hydrogen plus direct uh, plus uh, DRI, right? So, um, the, the, I'm sorry, the hydrogen reduction followed by the electric arc furnace, right? Because that is potentially also uh, carbon free, right? Uh, so, uh, but on the calcium carbonate side, uh, so if you were going to look at this as a chemical problem, so what you really want is, so calcination is the production of uh, calcium oxide, release of CO2. So if you wanted to look at the chemical production of calcium oxide from calcium carbonate, are there really no uh, alternatives other than cooking it? I mean, isn't, I mean, is the there, issue. I mean. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is the reaction. As calcium carbonate can make calcium oxide as a product and CO2. So no matter how you made it, you, didn't have, you need a precursor for calcium that wasn't calcium carbonate then you wouldn't release CO2 if you made the oxygen. So right. What but about the on the back end, though? If you fully carbonate that lime that you've made that leaves calcium oxide, then if you use the renewable fuel up front for the heat, you should be at, at baseline, stoichiometrically. So Over about 50, 50, hang on, hang on a sec. Over about 50 years, both Steve and I reckon that you're going to carbonate about 50% of it, yeah. roughly. So. Um, you uh, you you do actually you do actually um, get rid of some of the emissions that you're you're making the the yes. calcium oxide. Yeah. Carbon dioxide yeah. Right. Right, but this is a, it's, it's a hydration reaction in which the, one of the reactants is calcium oxide, right? So so isn't your goal to get the calcium oxide? Find calcium oxide that. Yeah. Right. But not from the carbonate. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so, you have to find but, another abundant calcium yeah. ion source. Okay, for, I left that one part. So if you could decompose calcium oxide and capture the CO2 as another carbonate that you were willing to say, you know, that yeah. landfill. Yeah, right. but, you, but you could, you, that's mineralization. You could do that with any source of CO2. So, right. Just two quick things on that chemistry. So the MIT announcement said that they could actually go to oxygen plus carbon or CO. Right? Again, pulling the chemistry further on so that you're not left with just CO2. So, but so now you make fuel. Now you're making fuel, so you put a lot of energy in. Yeah. Right. They did all that with solar. Again, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. they're claiming yeah, no, in a, true, you know, but, but you in a beat. Do it anyway, you just need to put right. a lot of energy in. Yeah. yeah. So, so, it turns out that the calcium oxide to calcium carbonate reaction just gives you the missing energy to <laughs> go of going from carbon dioxide, from carbon and, and water to carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Probably. It, it comes out within one kilojoule per mole. Our airship? Yes, you can, you can push that's it. About, up, that's about the. You number. can push it with calcium oxide to calcium carbonate, and yeah. it just fits. Huh. And people have actually, like Albert Steinfeld has looked at solar furnaces, yeah, yeah. which basically do this, and you get an extra third of energy into your hydrogen from, from coal, which came actually from sunshine. Yeah. Mm. Well, what you hear? Uh, this is a quick one because there's also just mentioned, I think it was Klaus, this issue as you use more and more recycled, your, your entropy is increasing from the perspective of diluting expensive alloying elements. Is there any way to get them back out again? So that you can, you uh, otherwise you're going to get in trouble because of scarcity of the alloying elements uh, building up in this this recycled iron. Maybe electrochemical solves that problem. Yeah. Agree. We need to work on it. <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 it's striking how the big difference in the opportunity space between steel and cement is the reuse and recycle in the steel and with so little potential in the cement. And if we think more about uh, life cycle and cradle to cradle opportunities, are, are there things we're missing in cement that let us either reuse um, concrete or that, that provides some kind of a pathway that, that, does, that means that we have something other than every ton of cement that's ever been produced just ends up being uh, crushed for, for gravel, basically? I haven't seen one. Um, and the, the big advantage, 
the big advantage of it being crushed with gravel is that it then takes up a hell of a lot of CO2 quickly. think of it as a 100-year problem rather than a 50-year problem, you could make the argument that the calcium oxide, the calcium carbonate was actually carbon neutral. Right. Certainly, yeah. Less so than fossil CO2. Yeah. Uh, maybe a two or three hundred, maybe five hundred year yeah, problem. Yeah, that would be So, so I'd say that's interesting. What is, I you should call on me if there's <laughs> <laughs> so what is the cycle time, the natural cycle? Because I know Steve had pointed me to some papers that I didn't have a chance to read uh, that uh, pointed out that the, cows, that the cement actually does uptake CO2 back over its lifetime. And so if, if it does that enough, it really is a closed carbon loop. And there is no net CO2 emitted at steady state in this I, process. I Just think it goes you in to transform it. But I think so you have to grind up the building in order to not, make it. Not, not, not entirely. <laughs> not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have a clarification question of just really at steady state, assuming you build and then you crush your building and you do it over again, um, what's the uptake time of CO2 in order to keep it at steady state from cement manufacture? Yeah. Is I think it, there's a rumor that Roman cement was better than ours because they carbonated in the last 2,000 years. I think he is right, 500. Well, so probably. we've done some calculations, and I've had conversations with Paul. It actually turns out he's done some very similar ones, and I think we're on uh, <laughs> relatively similar results. But we've found that when you look at all the use and all of the cement that's been made since 1930, cumulative process emission from calcination, about 43% of those is what we came up with have been reabsorbed by carbonating cements. So that's not nothing over that period of time. That's pretty big. Yeah. Now again, half of the CO2 from cement manufacture is energy, though. So right. That's right. not even right. really but, but you could, in principle, decarbonize the energy. Right. right. So if you yeah. discounted that to zero, then this is the relevant you're question. you're a quarter right. of current emissions. Yeah. Quarter, yeah. Over a yeah. hundred year time scale, over a fifty year time scale. No, it, it goes as a, it goes as the um, it's Fickian diffusion, so it's uh, t to the half. Yeah. Right. And so it carbonates with a rate that goes as t to the half. So maybe yeah, half maybe two hundred years. You, you, well, you close could, it. in principle, enhance this by doing more of the crushing and recycling, yeah. not just burying it off the air in the landfill. Well, Grinding like energy, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it does. It's just. I know that's what it does. What, what, is the, what are the reaction rates uh, around the concrete as a question? They're pretty I fast, <laughs> but they never give you more back than you calcite out yeah. the day you start. It. You can only get back to zero that fast. I'll pass you. I, I, I will send you the uh, fantastically interesting paper a statistical analysis of the rate of carbonation of concrete which you can l read at your leisure. <laughs> Just one technical question on this business of the um, reuptake of CO2. Does the use of fly ash in the concrete change that in any way? Um, I'm not sure, but you're only going to have about 10% fly ash in there. So, um, yeah, the fly ash will have a... a small proportion of calcium oxide in it as well but yeah I wouldn't I can uh, in fact it is in the paper on uh, on statistical analysis of carbonation so I can <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it in my head I don't know about the fly ash but I do know we looked a little bit about the engineers structural engineers of course don't like the process of carbonation because it weakens the cement so they've been working against the carbon sink notion by putting certain coverings and <laughs> treating them so they don't take up as much CO2. Yeah, yeah. And so we tried to factor some of that into our calculations. I think I would wait until the building is gone. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, I think Klaus has been waiting very patiently for a Not really. I was <laughs> heavily engaged in the rest of the discussion. Yeah. But I, I did have one more point I would like to raise particularly on these extremely large, large processes, and maybe the way to tackle it is to get away from being that large in individual units and think how to get there. 
And people, I, I do come back to the car engine example, which is a lot cheaper than a power plant, but the thing which really struck me, if you look at the U.S. production of car engines and ask how much power capacity do we build in a single year, it exceeds our standing power plant fleet every year. So lots of small units can do a lot of things too. And particularly in steel and concrete, cement, I see another example. These things are very slow processes and therefore in effect they are capital intensive in a roundabout way because you just, the flow through your equipment is very, very slow. And if you could accelerate this, and in a way the mini mills in Texas one on that count, and there was years ago an article which sort of caught my attention where they said, the residence time of that iron in that furnace is two minutes. It's a couple of days in a blast furnace, and that explains the size difference, and so thereby also some costs. So to really start thinking about how to, how to come at these things from small scales rather than large scales, I think would be worthwhile and, and sort of take advantage of the mass manufacturing uh, cost reductions rather than the cost reductions of the economies of scale. And I do think one could do something with this, but I think that gets us off on a long tangent now. But I did want to raise this issue and see your, your views on this. I, I mean, I, I, I take your point, Klaus. I, when I think about, I mean, electric arc furnace is obviously at a much smaller scale, and it's actually amenable to that. When I think about how to make steel from iron, I, I haven't, I guess I, I take the point, but it is hard for me to imagine uh, at this moment how to do that. It's easier for me to imagine material substitution and thinking about making other materials that aren't, that aren't, yeah, that aren't iron-based than it is for me to figure out how to make the millions of tons of steel we need a year in, in a lot of little small pieces. Uh, at least with that current process. Now maybe there's a fundamentally different way to reduce iron that would be amenable to small scales and would leave you with a, a product that could be castable and therefore, you know, essentially then could be rolled. Um, I just have not run to anybody, and, and I, I worked with the people in Amiden in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, and I, I, that's a pretty sharp bunch of people trying to think about what to do on the steel front, and there just hasn't been anything out there that I know of that says, well, here's really a different way to do it that would lend itself to small scale. It's easier for me to think about some other material being turned into a, a structural material. I mean, it's difficult because the um, temperatures are so high. You want to have, a, you know, uh, reduce the surface to volume ratio. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it. Nothing's impossible. I mean, um, you know, it's it's always worth having a look at these sort of things. Cement plants aren't by nature all that big to start with. Yeah. So uh, yeah. But then. What's the what's the benefit? I mean, essentially, cement plants sit, in general, on top of a big cement uh, cement, a big limestone deposit, and then they just use that limestone deposit until it's done, and then then they might think of something else. But part of it is the shorter lifetime. You're not committed forever, isn't it? Once you're not committed to a billion dollar investment, you don't need to make things last 50 years. I think someone brought this up earlier, but maybe uh, CO2 per ton is not the right metric. So I have friends in material science who are trying to, who think they're on a path to, for instance, uh, make aluminum the strength of steel, or to you know, triple the, the strength of steel, and uh, so, you know, uh, if, you, if our metric were CO2 per megapascal of uh, yield strength, <laughs> you, you might uh, have a different uh, look on this, right? And so, you know, in, as technologies advance, you tend to move to different metrics other than per mass, right? And so that, uh, um, you know, that may be worth thinking of because if so, 
And inherently, all the auto companies, of course, do this, right? They'd rather have a thinner steel panel that costs less, uses less steel because higher strength. Right? I mean, at, at heart, you, you're basically coming down to CO2 per value add. Exactly. Which is, the, right. which is yeah, what I would, that's why it's so difficult to decarbonize lime and cement. So are there, are there high strength cements then? To ask the same question that, you know, I know of examples in steel. I'm sure there are. Did you get away with <laughs> one third the amount of, uh, of uh, cement? Right. I, I would doubt it because it would come down to building codes and uh, all sorts of things. And it's so conservative, the industry. The civil engineers are working to do things like additives, like fiber additives and other things to increase the strength of, of concrete. And we have civil engineering students who build canoes out of the stuff and go out on lakes with it. So there, there, there is room for improvement, large improvement in terms of strength and, and uh, maybe mass reductions, carbon reductions as well. It's true, but, but you know, I doubt they build the shard out of it, you know, the shard in London. I, I understand. Not for, not for 50 years. That, that's the problem with the codes and standards and their inflexibility to, to allow you to use uh, better construction approaches. And I think the other fundamental issue is infrastructure that has service life of multiple decades drives you to be conservatism and dri drives you towards conservatism and drives you away from being able to be innovative. To, to Pear's comment, I, this is something I sometimes find myself daydreaming about, but like metaphysically, are there trade-offs between flexibility and stability? And you know, there are some reasons, as you've just articulated, for why we would want shorter lifetime infrastructure and to be more innovative and whatnot. But there's also reasons that we'd like our infrastructure to be resilient uh, in the face of you know whatever changing conditions and things we face. So I, you know, we could have an offline conversation, but. I want to just say one more thing about this conservatism of codes and uh, what's the right trade-off between encouraging innovation and, and uh, preventing the risk of catastrophes from having things not worked out right. And it seems like, you know, even though this meeting isn't focused on the social and institutional components, this is probably one of the most important ones, and it's not one that people typically talk about, is how do we create a landscape in which there's a dynamic of innovation that people really can have confidence in. And you know, lots of the issues that we're viewing here as genuine <coughs> gotchas, as roadblocks, really could be addressed if we had a more systematic way of thinking about how to, how to have an innovation-friendly, resilience-friendly environment. <coughs> Okay, we've got about five minutes left. One more question. Is that a question? Yeah, just picking up on this uh, discussion, I, you know, I do think that, because I've looked at this quite a bit, and I do think that um, certain features of technologies, some of which trace back to the physical principles on which they're based, <coughs> um, pose uh, specific challenges that are institutional, operational, um, sort of uh, affect perception of risk. <coughs> um, and so I think it's difficult to completely disentangle those issues from an evaluation of the technical challenges um, because you're signing up for certain institutional, operational, societal sort of risk perception challenges if you go down one technology path and others if you go down another. And they're actually, I think they can be traced back to features of technologies themselves and some of the physical principles on which they're based. So anyway, it's something maybe at some point we can talk about. I've thought a lot about it. Um, just wanted to mention that. Okay, do we want to take any final reflections on gotchas and how to get around them and where you'd place your investments? The, um, <clears throat> the major things that I would say that um, need doing in 
cement side of things is demonstrations at the 20 to 30 megawatt scale for um, each of the uh, technologies that I've discussed. Um, more basic lab work I don't think is going to do too much. Um, the oxyfuel system needs demonstrating at about one megawatt. The other two are already demonstrated at about two megawatts, so you want to go up to about uh, 30 megawatts, and then after that you could go to a full plant without that, without that much of a um, problem. One of the key things, and just uh, to pick up on what you've just said, uh, Jessica, is that um, when we looked at um, how the, the overall costs of CO2 um, capture in industry and all these sorts of things, one of the biggest effects was the, uh, you know, what perceived learning rate we put into the um, system and how many, you know, when we actually started with a plant, right? And the issue that we've got at the moment is that we're not building the first generation of plants. If we don't build something now, it's going to be a very long time before we build the second generation of plants and uh, things are always going to stay expensive. So my view would be to, um, you know, that, that we've really got to get on with it. I think on, on the steel front, a couple of things. One, there are a number of things that are going on around the world, primarily in Europe, uh, to sweat the assets that we have right now for much lower CO2 footprint. The US is far behind. I, I worked with a big steel manufacturer um, there was 50 million of, uh, savings on $270 million a year and they weren't willing to invest in it because they, they just weren't willing to take the three-year payback. Somehow we have to incent that. Um, in the, uh, I, I think that, so that's here and now and should start going on right, right away. Um, there's gonna, something else needs to happen though to get a consortium of people, countries, to look beyond the current assets of which there's lots of billions in the ground already to say, well, what, what's next and how much steel do, integrated steel do we really need versus uh, mini mill steel versus material substitution. And so I think a takeaway from this discussion today for me is how do we lay out that roadmap or at least the call for that roadmap so at least there's an understanding of how things could evolve over the next 25 to 30 years so we don't wake up in 2040 going, boy, we need a roadmap because we do need to get it going on it right now and hopefully retire the, the worst assets over time and ensure that we are, we are helping promote the use of steel and, and other heavy industry processes like that in a way that has, you know, has to be thinking ahead at least a quarter century, basically.